Nazga. Hundreds of miles from anywhere. It is not for the meek, it's not for the timid. If you question your own abilities, be somewhere else. The clock is ticking. We have to really prepare ourselves for the cold winter. Temperatures are dropping. This is a seriously harsh environment. And daylight is disappearing. Winter's barreling down on me like a freight train. On this season of Life Below Zero. There was a bear sighting just a few hundred yards away. Everybody feels it's going to be an extremely aggressive bear year. This is very hungry country where I am. There's a reason why I'm the only person within many miles of here. If I fell down, it'd be a slow, painful death. Woo! A lot of people die every year in Alaska going through the ice. This time of the year, doesn't matter what you feel like, you still got to get up and get the job done. Oh, we got a live one. We're hunters, not farmers. We chase it down and kill it, or we get nothing at all. We can break down, freeze to death, we can crash, but you got to get out there and earn it. It's hard when you're cold and you're shaking. If it was easy, it really wouldn't be fun. My name is Susan Akins, and I live 197 miles above the Arctic Circle, just a few miles from the Arctic Ocean. I live by myself out here at a place called Kavik River Camp. Population one. The meat that I hunt directly means I live or I die. I still don't have enough to get me through the winter. Gonna go a ways upriver and set up a tent and see what I can get. The goal is... I need to fill my freezer, to put it in my belly, so I don't die this way. Weather in the Arctic is absolutely unpredictable. Every sign says big, bad winter again. So I have to be prepared for snow, cold, pretty much the whole gamut. It's the changing of the guard. Summer and the bounty of that summer is going to go away. The caribou migrate out, they're gone. The bears go to bed, they're gone. Most of the birds migrate out, they're gone. So if I'm gonna get meat, I've gotta get it now. I'm hoping to leave with an empty sled and come back with a full one. Nighttime is back, northern lights are back. It's just a quick slide now into the fun that we call winter. To stock up for the impending winter, Sue heads to where the Kavik River meets several valleys. A prime spot to source food. There's your ptarmigans. Oh, I see some ptarmigans way out there. I don't think I'll just have to get close and see where they're hiding. I do have one. Let me go find him. All right, well, at least we got one for dinner. Thank you, little birdie. This is a good first step in filling my freezer, but I'm gonna need to do a whole lot more hunting to survive this winter. I have ideas for how I want my life to be, and you can make the life you want when you live out in the bush like this. There's nobody telling you what to do or what not to do. I'm Andy Bassage. I live here at Calico Bluff. Ever since I was a young boy, I kind of had this gut feeling that I wanted to live out in the woods. When I moved up here, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything about Alaska. But uh, there was something, some deep drive inside of me that uh, put a calling to me to, to come out here and live here. My name is Kate Rourke. There are no roads to where I live. 
No close neighbors. Just a whole lot of wildlife and 20 sled dogs. In Alaska, we call it a subsistence living. Years ago, they would have called it a frontier life, living out in the woods and being self-sufficient as much as possible. For us in the upper Yukon, we go from summer to winter very, very quickly here. Fall times are very short, and there's a lot to do in the fall with harvesting gardens, hunting moose, and, and catching fish for both ourselves and the dogs, and we only have about three weeks to do that. It's a major hurry now to get the wheel across the river so that we can get the good fish and get them as fresh as we can to put up for ourselves. Andy and Kate rely on their homemade fish wheel in order to secure food from the river. But getting it in the water is a grueling task. It's a big job putting a fish wheel in, especially when it's just one or two people. Quite frankly, everything that has to do with fishing and fish wheels is heavy. It takes a lot of self-motivation to live out in the bush. Uh, you've got to be able to push yourself. If you're a person that, uh, when the going gets tough, you just kind of sit down and wait it out. You're not going to do very well out here because uh, that resource will either go by or uh, your opportunity will be missed. We're the last community in Alaska before these fish go into Canada. So we're at the end of the line, basically. So even though a run comes in really strong, if it's fish like crazy down in the middle and lower river, there may not be a lot of fish in this run that make it up to here. We know when they're expected to come, but we don't know what the numbers are going to be. So right now, every minute counts of getting that wheel in the water. So the quicker we get it in the water, the more luck we're going to have of getting some fish to put up for ourselves. I didn't come here to hide from anything. I didn't come here to find myself. I just took the skills I have, and I focused it into the proper way of managing to make a living for his children. packages it comes wrapped in skin we have to skin it we have to take the muscle groups apart and separate the bones there it's a lot of work all right but it's well worth it it's really clean food it's beyond organic i'm edward hailstone my friends and family call me chip i live with uh, five of my daughters and my wife here in Arctic, alaska along kobuk river I live a subsistence lifestyle. We hunt, we fish, we gather, and we do it as a team. My name is Agnes Hailstone. I was born in Narvik, raised here. I've been here pretty much all my life. My daughters were born here, and hopefully they'll do the same. So I'm thinking, this place needs a cache. I need a place to put this up and to hang it in. Yeah. The best thing to do is just uh, build a little something here. Just build it here? Yeah, we could use it this winter until we're done with it. So the care of what we get here will go in the cache. Yeah, it'd take at least 10, 10 yep. logs per wall. And it's going to take beams for the floor and beams for the roofing. So I'm probably looking at like 50, 60 logs. Okay. With dark winter approaching, the hailstones will soon partake in their most crucial hunt of the season. In preparation, they must replace their old meat rack with a new cache that can store larger quantities of meat. When we're gathering wood, we have to go at least five miles away from this town. Look at that. Even skinny ones, are, oh wow, we scarred. Even those little ones will do fine for the top stuff. especially when we live up here in the extreme cold and um, it's always good to have extra laying around because even your neighbors is gonna run out of fuel and they'll end up having to rely on wood. They all say he who chops his own wood heats himself up twice. So I'm throwing these logs out in the river and she can bring the boat right up to him, add a loop or two to him, and then go to the next one and go to the next one. We're doing something that's uh, terribly efficient and terribly useful. And the benefits out of this is everything from heat to buildings and then back to heating that building. <laughs> 
Looks like the wife is coming down, catching up with the logs. And looks like um, all the ones I've tossed in there along the bank here are about ready to get picked up here pretty soon. She's adding rope, tying them into a bunch. I think she's doing a good job. I was going to go over there to the wife and go jump in the boat and maybe start maneuvering her a little faster. Here's the next bunch, right? Okay. Take this out and attach it to that one. to nature, I feel, when I live the way I do here. My name's Glenn Villeneuve. I live 200 miles north of Fairbanks in the Brooks Range of Alaska. I'm a 60-mile walk from the nearest road. My nearest neighbor lives I don't know how far away. I picked this place because nobody else was utilizing the resources here. It was a place where I could go hunt, trap, fish, live as close to the land as I wanted to. And it's the place I consider home. It's early in the morning. It's just barely starting to get light out. And this is the first day that I've decided that I want to look for a moose. With almost nothing else to eat, I can get by for six months on a moose. OK, that has a razor sharp edge on it now. That'll shave hair right off of my arm. When you're eating very little carbohydrate, like I often am out here, I have to get about 3 quarters of my calories from fat. Mm. Fat's hard to find. A lot of animals don't have enough fat to go with the meat. The really critical thing is to get a moose with a lot of fat on it. It's the time of year when the moose are mating and the bull moose stop eating. And every day that passes, the longer it takes me to get a moose, the leaner that moose is likely to be. This magazine holds four rounds. But if everything goes right, it's only going to take one to kill a moose. When I pull the trigger and that moose drops, that's six months food right there. I have to be really careful not to make noise. And more often than not, I've detected moose by ear rather than by seeing them. A lot of times, it takes 10 days to find a moose before I get a good shot at one. So I just have to be patient, pace myself, keep my energy going so that I can get a moose and then still have energy left to get the moose home. I just heard a moose. Mm. Mm. They 
keep moving further away from me into the forest, further and further away from the lake, and I really need to get them close to the lake so I can get them home. The bull's right behind the cow. I can't shoot right now. <laughs> It's always scary because there's always the chance I don't get one. And if I don't get a moose, it would be really hard for me to live out here. I live dynamically close to my environment. It's right up my backside and I'm crawling on top of it. So we better be able to get along, say sorry when we do something wrong, and thank you when it goes right. a little bit so I can get a good look over. Now I want to just drop in and follow it and see what I see. See if there's a good little campy spot. See if I like the setup. Am I seeing sign? If not, I'll go towards the river. All you can do is check it out and throw the dart and hope for the best. With winter on the horizon, Sue Akins is on a quest to secure food for the long months ahead. some animals in they can come down this valley down that valley up this one or down that one i mean it's as good a shot as any i say i set up camp when it gets dark out here you definitely feel vulnerable expected to be a pretty brutal year with the bears living by herself hundreds of miles from the nearest hospital Sue must protect herself from the region's many apex predators. This is going to be some bear fencing. I'll get it to go around a few times, and then you hook up a battery to it and some leads, and zap! If a little bear tries to make a snack out of Susie, he's going to get macked. Sometimes all you need is a couple of seconds to get yourself ready. Alaskans are very unique people. We're all very independent, especially people living out in the bush. We're all very inventive, tough, hardy souls that want to take care of themselves. Andy and Kate must get their fish wheel in the water or risk missing their opportunity for salmon. Let's flip this over so that the boards are up. Yep. When fall hits, it's the crunch time. And we've got to get everything done before that snow flies. There's no time to stop. There's no time to rest. There's hardly time to take a breath. It's always very nerve wracking for me putting the fish wheel in. The last thing I want is the day I want to go fishing to break my wheel putting it in and then spend three or four days trying to fix something. All right, ready to go fishing now. Fall chum have a very short cycle of really up and really down. And when they're up, they're up really good. When they're down, they crash. There's nothing. Son of a bitch. That's turning too fast. They're below zero. I'm going to hang that meat up today. In the Arctic Circle. Once I get this meat upwards safe from bears, it's safe for the rest of the winter. Even refrigerating your food. This is a meat pole that I built. Bears cannot get to meat on this meat pole. Is a risky proposition. Working alone, I have to be very careful. Whoa! 
Life Below Zero. New episode next Thursday at 9 on National Geographic. I can't wait to eat that moose nose. Just thinking about it makes me hungry. Son of a bitch. That's turning too fast. That's turning almost too fast. Let's bring it in some. I feel like the current's a lot faster here this year than it was last year. So we don't have to have as long of a spar. We don't have to have as long of a lead. Generally, I like somewhere between five and six rotations a minute. So one full rotation about every 10 seconds. That keeps one basket of the wheel in the water fishing almost all the time. What we want is we want those baskets to be coming down and just barely digging a hole into the gravel. And that makes a place to where the fish can't go underneath the wheel. So if it can slowly dig a hole for itself, that increases the efficiency of the wheel dramatically. That's about where we want it. Woohoo! Seems to be turning really good and touching bottom and not going too fast, so. Looks like we found our spot. Yeah, fishy, fishy, fishy. It's a crapshoot. We have no idea what's going on other than I know there are fish coming up. How many? I guess tomorrow morning will tell. There we go. First fish. Looks like a nice one. I'm very excited. We got our fish wheel in, and it's going, and it's catching, and it went in as smooth as so. Tomorrow would be great if we had maybe 100 fish. That would be a really good start for us. I live out here for the freedom of doing things my way and the way that I feel like doing them when I feel like doing them. No hours, no bosses. That's what it's all about. It's always been the best way to move a lot of firewood in one shot. Hell of a lot easier than dragging it on a sled. Just six or seven pieces at a time. Yeah, there's no getting stuck, there's no being frozen, there's no breaking your equipment. Much easier. We have really small trees up here because it's the Arctic and they have a real short growing season. And we have real long winters and then we have real deep cold. Even though it's hard work, I enjoy doing this because I can see heat and then um, we can also build things with them. Homeward now, huh? Yeah. Raw materials to us is part of the essence of subsistence. It's getting stuff yourself, getting materials from the lands, the things you need. in places that you want to frequent. You do need to have places to keep your things dry. You need to keep yourself dry sometimes. So as an emergency backup, I could walk inside the cache and say, well, I need to sleep around the floor. And that's happened more than once. I got a V-notch on the top, and on the bottom, I have it notched like that. So when they rest, they'll rest like that upon each other. I'm going to split this one in half so it has a flat half that'll meet my flat floor and my flat beam so I can start the logs on top of it. And that way, it can all disassemble and I can take it in pieces in other places, and I can reassemble it. Living a subsistence lifestyle is basically working for yourself. And what we're doing is we're going out and we're getting materials, raw materials, and we put it all together to make a living. You know, we have it down for ourselves. Nobody wakes us up in the morning and tells us what to do or where to go or how to get there. Um, we've learned over the years, throughout my life, just experiences themselves have amounted to this. This is actually excellent. Through its chain. These things happen. 
as part of having any machinery. This, this isn't a recreational use. It's like our snow machines or our chainsaws. We don't just recreationally use these so we can have a little bit of wood at the cabin, you know, for the two weeks out of the year we use it. Damn it, we are using these things all the time. And we're constantly in state of repair. With caribou season just days away, Chip must hurry to complete his cache in order to store meat from the upcoming harvest. Instead of just trying to use a chainsaw to make a rounded cut, I'm going down to the depth I want it to be. Then I'm making my cross cuts. It takes out the pieces a lot easier. Now that one fits. From here on, it's pretty much just cut and notch and stack. And I'll have my walls. We live out here to live a certain lifestyle, to be connected to the land, to get the resources from the land. And that's what's important to me. You untie and I'll drive. We're gonna go check the wheel for a second day, see what we get. We're hoping it's not too many fish. We still want to put up a few more fish for ourselves. It's very time consuming to cut them for human consumption, to do it right. Uh, scoring them. There's a lot of work that goes into brining them, getting them ready to go into the smoker. If we get females, we'll probably smoke some eggs. So we have some caviar. All of that takes a lot of time, so 100, 150 fish would be great. It could be really bad news if we pull up and the boxes are overflowing with fish. So I don't want to have to deal with 400 fish. It'd be really nice to deal with maybe 100 fish. We could focus on cutting and drying and smoking some of the fish that we want, and it won't take me long to put up 100 fish for the dogs. That's nothing for us. I guess we're going to find out here real quick. Uh-oh. We're probably close to 300. So it looks like we got our work cut out for us today. Definitely would much rather have a few less fish, but better too much than none. Guess the run's picking up. I think from here on out, it's gonna be slam bam. Uh, we got a lot of fish today, kind of like an Easter egg hunt. You show up at your wheel and you see how many eggs you got in the basket. That's the way every day is out here. We've got 200 fish. They probably average right around seven pounds a piece. That's not a half bad looking fish right there. <laughs> Keeper. All in all, things are going pretty good. It's a little more work than I really wanted to do today. By the time I cut these fish and then clean the fish for ourselves, I think I'm gonna be a sore little puppy by the end of the evening. I'm not complaining. I'd much rather have the fish than not have the fish. It's all about an economy of, of your time and energy out here. There's so much to do. It's really important that what you spend your time on is done efficiently and cost effectively. That's why I've always been a fish wheel fisherman. For us, it's a really efficient way to put up food. Okay, well, you've got 30 done. So about 160 to go. <laughs> For me, living involves hunting and killing in order to live. It's the natural cycle, part of the cycle of life and death, and I'm participating in it every day out here. It's my fifth day hunting moose now, and I'm over in an area that I know is a good spot for moose at this time of year. I'm gonna move down in here carefully this morning and see if I can find a bull moose.
living up here in the Arctic in the winter, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of food. I eat a lot. I eat about three pounds of meat every day. Meat and fat. That's what sustains me in the cold weather. I can smell it. a nice looking ball too there goes the cow that was with him she's out of here now she's an extra she's mooing and mooing she's wanting to get bread and he thinks that i'm another bull coming to take his cow he doesn't want that so he came over here to fight he was over here to chase me off this is the fifth day looking for a moose i've walked about 25 miles looking for this moose around the lake to eat just this moose here would feed me for almost six months it's really an important moment for me to get a moose like this it was a lot of work but i got him and i got six months food right here it's a good moment for me i would rather live this way by hunting than by buying my food in a store that's the way i live out here it's the natural cycle we never had no big dream for big houses we treat this like a camp it's a place where we can take shelter, we can eat, we can see our family. It's pretty nice. It's coming together. It's good. You guys got a few more logs to add here. Maybe four more on here. In order to store and preserve the meat from the hailstones' upcoming caribou hunt, Chip is putting the finishing touches on the family's new cache. The roof will be cross beams like this, and uh, put up several of them, and then probably run a pole underneath them for support, and then um, put plywood. The only thing I'm lacking is sheets of plywood. In Norfolk, the hailstones rely on trading within the community to support their subsistence lifestyle. We're almost quite done with our cash, but um, we need a few ply bards, so um, I'm just gonna walk around. My neighbor have some ply bards here, and I might have something that he would like, and so I was just gonna go ask him if he'd like to trade or um, if I could buy some of his um, ply bards. <laughs> yeah, good to see you again. 
I noticed you have a lot of climb words. Uh, yeah, this would be perfect. Wow, these are nice. Are you willing to trade? What would you have to trade for this? I got 10 gallons of gas. 10 gallons of gas? Okay, yeah. that's a good deal. Yeah, yeah good deal right there. These are good. a perfect yep. score. Those boards are like $120 piece boards right there. And um, for four of them, and he's not using them, and um, he needs gas, and I need board, so it's a good trade for the both of us. I'm gonna go tell tell him the boards I traded for his gas, and I have to go ask him for his gas now. <laughs> It's a calculated risk every time you step out the door. There's no guarantees in anything. The only guarantee is it's a limited time engagement, so why not pack it full of experiences? Got a big rain system coming in, and that will just damage the hunting. My visibility goes down to nil, and uh, the animals are just gonna find some hole and hunker down. I'm looking for anything that's gonna provide meat that's legal. They're all on the menu, but I need to get there, get closer, and get the good visual. Here they are. Where are they going? They call them ghosts of the tundra, and what that means is they're using the geographic features. Dips and swales, and they'll travel around in them, and then all of a sudden they're on high ground. So for the human eye, you're looking and, whoa, where'd they come from? They're just standing out in the middle of the field. What you don't know is there's a little dip they traveled in. And then you go, oh, okay, you reach your gun and where'd they come? They're gone. Now I'm gonna do the same thing that they do. I'm trying to keep a geographical feature in between the two of us. So I'm turning the tables on it. They use it to hide and pop up and down. I'm using it to hide and pop up and down. This is the game trail. Bear. We've got bear and caribou. I know they came through this way. Okay, Alright, I see one. Okay, she just made me. I can't really get, looks to be two, three hundred yards. I've got to take myself out of the brush. Okay, 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 okay. All right, come on, come on, baby, come on, baby. picked it right there was bear tracks wolf tracks caribou tracks moose tracks this is definitely the confluence where you're funneling now time to go see what i got i've got to go retrieve the meat before some of the predators decide to relieve me of the responsibility i've got a big old storm coming in the forecast is keep dropping in temperature and snow this time of year i can get three foot of snow in no time flat winter is breathing down my neck Right now it's going slate gray, which this time of year means snow. I can trap myself out here, so I want to get this done quickly. Very first caribou that I got, I was maybe 12 or so. Different things happened in my younger life and left me kind of raising myself and being alone out in the wilderness of Alaska. Bus driver handed me a gun and said, you don't learn to shoot. You're not going to be here. Figure it out. Got a handful of bullets. I was pretty hungry. I was pretty cold. Here comes this animal. And I first thought of Santa, you know, and was pretty starstruck. And then my belly rumbled. I took it down. And it was a harsh reality. It's kind of a full circle moment. Thank you taking the first life and being grateful and not being hungry anymore to being better at it still being grateful and i won't be hungry this winter i've been down here a little while working on this 
There's no predator within 10 miles that doesn't know it's here, so they're going to be coming in. So I want to get out. Temperature went down, it's come up again. Just looks really unpredictable. I know I'm in bear territory, and I'm going to add snow, fog, and everything else in on it. It's not a particularly safe, secure feeling. For me to stay here, it's really got to pay off. I'm not seeing the numbers of caribou that say, yeah, take another day. What if I get stuck out here a week and can't get in? It's time to wrap this portion of the trip up, you know, live to hunt another day. This is a place that you can take your kids and say, hey, look, this is how to have a good time. This is a place where there's days of high adventure and a lot of other people are jealous. straight. I notch the tops and then join them together and then um, put a cross piece into each one just to hold them in place because I'm working by myself. I'm almost done. Wow! You like that? Gee whiz, that's a lot since I left earlier. Cool! The caribous are starting to move, so it's real important that we get this cache done today. Because if we don't get this cache done, then we're not going to have a place to store our meats. I've got four sheets of plywood over here that my wife traded the neighbor for, and um, I'm going to put them up on the roof. What isn't forgotten and what's still very viable is gathering stuff for yourself, building stuff for yourself. This stuff is never outdated. No matter what my technology would be, if I was cutting these logs with laser beams, I'd still end up with a log cache. Someday the girls will come and look at this and say, hey, look, this is how my mom and dad did it. Yep. I'm sure you'll get all the credit. <laughs> this is so cool. I used basically what I could go out and go gather and keep it the cheapest. My wife traded gasoline off for sheets of plywood, and I bought a couple pounds of nails for like 10 bucks. I would say in the end, it probably cost us less than $100. And um, of course, it's about three days of my time. I'm gonna have to put you a step here. Here you go, woman. It's all yours. You use 35 logs. Cool. And only six of them are halves. And it's real easy for me to go in and out of there. It's your size. So that should help things. Hey, babe, how you like it? Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. Look, you can go in and peek. <laughs> Who knows, Mary? Someday it might even be yours. We might be old and gone and dead. And you might be an old lady and telling your kids, my dad built that. Go ahead, have fun. This right here could last uh, long enough that my daughters could be using this when they grow up. So close. We just gotta go work and take the kids and go up river and spend a couple of days doing our terrible hunt and then come back and go fill it up. The perfect door is that big enough to get through? Yeah. Sun's just about down and I'm tired. It's time to give it up. Love you. Have fun. Thank you. Yeah. You're Sounds awesome. Good. So You're are you. So are dusty and awesome. <laughs>